If World War III really started tomorrow, would there be a shelter that could actually save your life? Most people imagine bunkers from movies, hidden deep underground, stocked for years and safe from anything. But what does science and real-world experience tell us about the perfect shelter? Tonight we will break down what really works, what is just a fantasy, and what you can actually do even if you are not a billionaire. Because the truth is, while no shelter is ever 100% safe, getting the fundamentals right could mean the difference between life and death. Here is what we are going to do in this guide. First, we will look at the real threats a shelter needs to defend against and why most shelters fail. Then, we will go step by step through the technical essentials. How deep and thick your shelter needs to be, how much space you need per person, what materials actually stop radiation, how to ventilate and filter the air, and what to avoid if you want to stay alive. Toward the end, I will show you a practical, expert-approved way to test if your shelter is actually safe, even if you do not have fancy equipment. And I will share tips on how to apply these lessons at home, even if you cannot build a bunker from scratch. Stay tuned, because some of these details might surprise you. Let's start with the basics. The idea of building a shelter is not just about surviving a Hollywood scenario, but about protecting against three very real threats. The initial blast, dangerous radiation, and radioactive fallout. According to official FEMA and Department of Homeland Security guidelines, the destructive power of a nuclear explosion comes in three waves. The first is the blast itself, a pressure wave that can flatten buildings for miles. The second is initial radiation, mostly gamma rays, which can be fatal within minutes if you are exposed near the detonation. The third, and often most underestimated, is fallout. Radioactive particles that are lifted into the atmosphere and fall back to Earth, contaminating everything for dozens or even hundreds of miles. That fallout is the real killer, because it can remain deadly for days or even weeks, spreading on the wind and entering water and food supplies. The U.S. government and international agencies all agree on one thing. The only real way to survive this scenario is to get underground and behind as much shielding as possible, as quickly as possible. But not all shelters are created equal. If you want real protection, you need to understand how depth, material, and design can save your life, and where the myths end and science begins. So what does a real shelter need? Let's start with depth and thickness because this is not just a technical detail. It is the single biggest factor in your chances of survival. Imagine standing underground with layers of earth or concrete between you and a cloud of radioactive fallout. Every inch counts. According to both FEMA and the Swiss Federal Office for Civil Protection, the international gold standard for nuclear sheltering you need at least one meter of solid, compacted earth above your head. That is about three feet, enough to reduce the gamma radiation from fallout to a fraction of what it would be at the surface. But if you are in a high-risk area, near a likely military target, or a major city, going deeper is even better. One and a half to two meters, or five to six feet, of earth or concrete can cut radiation levels by a factor of a thousand or more. In Switzerland, where every home built since the 1960s is required to have a fallout shelter, the minimum standard is often reinforced concrete one meter thick, or even more if space allows. Now it is not just about what is above you, but also the walls and even the floor. Ideally, your walls should be at least 30 centimeters thick, which is about a foot of concrete. If you do not have access to that much concrete, Packed earth works almost as well, as long as it is dry and well compacted. Sandbags are a classic low-tech solution and can be stacked to create an effective shield. Even dense materials you might already have, books, bags of rice, water barrels, can boost your protection if you arrange them correctly. The key is mass and density. Scientists call this the protection factor, or PF. You are aiming for a PF of 1,000, which means your shelter cuts outside radiation by a thousand times. To put that in perspective, if a lethal dose would kill you in an hour outside, inside a PF-1000 shelter, you could survive safely for weeks. 
And if you cannot achieve that much shielding, remember, every layer helps. Even just doubling up on sandbags or adding extra books and water can mean the difference between sickness and survival. Space is another point where many shelters fall short. People often underestimate how much room it takes to survive, not just for a few hours, but for days or even weeks. International guidelines recommend a minimum of 32 square feet per person, which is about three square meters, for at least 14 days. That means for a family of four, you need at least 13 square meters of space, plus room for supplies. Ceiling height matters too. At least two meters is best, both to prevent feelings of claustrophobia and to allow air to circulate. Crowded, low ceiling spaces are not just uncomfortable, they can become deadly hot and quickly fill with carbon dioxide. You also need a dedicated corner or a small area for waste and hygiene. This is not just about comfort. If one person gets sick in a sealed shelter, it can endanger everyone. Hygiene is survival, especially when you are sealed in for a long time. Let's talk more about materials. Concrete is the gold standard, strong, dense, and readily available in many places. But pouring a solid concrete bunker is out of reach for most people. That is where packed earth, sandbags, and even improvised materials come in. Water is surprisingly effective at blocking radiation. One foot of water is roughly as effective as one foot of concrete. Double walls filled with sand or earth can add protection without huge expense. Dense wood works too, though you need more thickness, about three feet of timber to match one foot of concrete. What does not work? Thin sheet metal, hollow plastic, or lightweight construction. These do almost nothing against gamma rays and can even create dangerous false confidence. It is always about the total mass between you and the fallout, not just what looks impressive in a photo. But all this protection means nothing if you cannot breathe. Ventilation is critical. Without enough fresh air, even the best built shelter becomes unlivable in a matter of hours, not days. Most heat-related or suffocation deaths in shelters happen because people underestimated this factor. The simplest, most reliable low-tech system is the Kearney Air Pump, or KAP, a hand-powered air-moving device that requires no electricity and has been tested in real-world scenarios by both the U.S. and Swiss civil defense. If you are able, modern NBC, nuclear biological chemical filters are ideal, but even a homemade system with long air shafts, bins to trap particles, and some form of manual pumping can keep you alive for a critical window. Remember, you need both incoming and outgoing airflow. Just poking a hole is not enough. Air needs to circulate to bring in oxygen and remove heat, carbon dioxide, and humidity. In very basic setups, even a hand fan and a simple air pipe can make a big difference, but you have to test it in advance. Finally, never forget, most shelter deaths in history have come not from direct radiation, but from overheating and lack of air. When you plan your shelter, imagine spending 14 days in a small, sealed room. Heat, humidity, and carbon dioxide rise fast. Ventilation can be the difference between survival and tragedy. So, to recap, go as deep as you can. Use the thickest and densest materials available. Allow enough space per person and plan ventilation as if your life depends on it, because it really does. And if you are improvising, remember that every extra layer, every sandbag, every barrel of water makes you safer. Coming up next, I will break down the most common mistakes people make with shelter construction and show you what to avoid so you do not repeat the errors of the past. This is where a lot of people, even so-called prepping experts, get it wrong. The first myth is thinking you need a luxury bunker full of high-tech gear and deep underground in a remote location. In reality, many of those luxury shelters are more about marketing than real safety. In fact, some are so over-designed for comfort that they forget the basics, like enough shielding, backup ventilation, or a way to remove waste. Another common mistake is building too shallow or with the wrong materials. A shelter that is only a few feet underground or built in a wooden shed will not stop dangerous radiation. Some people think a safe room for tornadoes is enough, 
But tornado shelters are not designed to block gamma rays or to be lived in for days or weeks. Another huge mistake is forgetting about air, ventilation is not optional, and closing yourself into a sealed box is a recipe for disaster. The last myth is about duration. Most fallout is most dangerous in the first 72 hours, but some particles stay hot for weeks. You need enough supplies for at least two weeks per person, four liters of water a day, long-lasting food, and ways to keep clean and deal with waste. Finally, do not forget about mental health. Small, dark, cramped shelters can break even strong people. Plan for boredom and stress. Cards, books, music, anything to help time pass. But this is not everything. In a moment, I will show you a simple way to test if your shelter is actually working, even if you do not have a Geiger counter or expensive equipment. Absolutely. Here is an expanded and more detailed version of this section designed to offer realistic step-by-step -step options for those without land or big budgets with plenty of practical solutions and retention hooks. Now let's get practical. Because most people do not have access to land, a backyard, or the means to build a dedicated concrete bunker. So what do you actually do if you are living in a regular house or even an apartment? The answer is, start with what you already have and think creatively about layers and barriers. If your home has a basement, this is usually your best starting point. Underground spaces naturally offer more shielding because the earth on all sides cuts radiation significantly. But even if your basement is unfinished or not fully below ground, you can dramatically increase protection. Focus on the corner of the basement farthest from outside walls and windows. Every extra foot of soil or concrete on the outside counts. If the basement ceiling is exposed, stack as much dense material as you can above that spot bags filled with dirt or sand, large containers of water, even furniture, or heavy books piled thickly. Think of building a protective cocoon or nest at the deepest, most shielded point. But what if you do not have a basement? For those in single-level homes or apartments, the next safest option is an interior room with no windows and as many walls between you and the outdoors as possible. Small spaces, like a closet, bathroom, or pantry, work well because they are often surrounded by walls on all sides. Again, the key is to add as much mass as you can around and above the area. Stack boxes filled with books, clothing, or bottled water against the walls. Use heavy tables, mattresses, or anything solid to cover doors and ceilings. Even filling garbage bags with dirt and layering them against the walls can make a difference. Every single inch of dense material you add between yourself and the outside reduces the amount of gamma radiation that can reach you. If you are in an apartment building, you might not be able to dig or move large amounts of earth, but you can still find safer spots. Choose a room near the center of the building, ideally on a lower floor but not the ground floor if you're in a high rise. Aim for floors with the most layers of concrete and rooms with no exterior walls. Bathrooms or stairwells often have extra layers of tile and concrete. Work with your neighbors if possible, combining resources and creating a communal shelter in the most protected spot multiplies everyone's odds of survival. No matter where you are, improvising shielding is possible. One proven trick from Cold War Civil Defense is to create a core shelter within a room. Select a small area in the center, then use furniture, boxes, suitcases, even filled plastic bins to build walls two or three feet thick on all sides. Cover the top with more boxes or heavy items, leaving a small opening for air. The goal is to concentrate your shielding where people will actually sit or lie down, making the most of whatever materials you have on hand. Now ventilation. Even in a makeshift shelter, airflow is critical. Open a vent or window as far away from the fallout side as possible, preferably on the opposite side of the building. If you have duct tape and plastic sheeting, use it to seal off doors and windows that face the likely direction of fallout, but always leave at least one air intake. You can even cut a hole in a cardboard box, attach it to a broomstick, and fan air in and out. If you are in a group, take turns operating the fan to keep air moving. Heat can build up fast in a small, sealed area, so watch for signs of overheating or low oxygen, like dizziness or headaches. Stocking up on essentials is just as important as shielding. 
For two weeks, each person needs at least four liters, about a gallon, of water per day. Choose foods that do not spoil, require little water, and can be eaten cold. Canned goods, energy bars, dry mixes. Store your supplies inside the shelter area, not outside, so you do not have to leave if the situation gets worse. Pack a basic emergency kit. Flashlights with extra batteries, first aid supplies, dust masks or even improvised face coverings, necessary medications, and some entertainment, books, playing cards, or a battery radio. Little things matter, especially for mental health. If you have pets, remember their needs too. Bring extra water, food, and a way for them to relieve themselves that keeps the shelter sanitary. Practice bringing everyone and everything into your core shelter in less than five minutes. Speed can be critical if warning is short. And here is one more tip. Practice these steps now, not just in theory. Try spending an hour in your improvised core shelter with everything shut as it would be in an emergency. See how quickly it gets hot, how much space you really have, and what supplies you might be missing. This simple drill can reveal surprises you do not want to discover when it is too late. Above all, remember that the key principle in any home or apartment is to maximize layers between you and the fallout outside. Every extra wall, every box, every gallon of water adds up. Even if you cannot build the perfect shelter, doing something is always better than doing nothing. Coming up, I will show you how to test your setup to see if it would actually work in a real emergency using tools you probably already have at home. Here's a simple test that even professionals use. To check for air leaks, seal yourself inside for an hour with a candle burning and see if the flame stays strong or flickers out. If it does, you need more ventilation. To test your shielding, stack the materials you plan to use and place a simple radiation source, like an old luminous watch or a smoke detector, on one side and a radiation detector on the other. If you do not have a detector, there are DIY plans online for building a Kearney fallout meter using household materials. For heat, measure the temperature inside after a few hours. If it gets too hot, add more ventilation. And do not forget to test your supplies. Try living for a day in your setup with the water and food you have stored. It is better to find out now if something is missing rather than after the fact. Not every house or location can support a real shelter. If your ground is too wet, if you cannot get enough mass above you, or if your shelter would flood or collapse, it is better to look for public shelters or even leave the area if you have warning. In areas with earthquakes, unstable soil, or high water tables, consult a structural engineer before digging or building anything underground. If you need to protect against chemical or biological threats, only certified NBC filtration systems are safe. Do not improvise with makeshift filters. If you cannot meet the basic requirements for shielding, ventilation, and supplies, do not risk a false sense of security. Sometimes the best plan is to focus on evacuation and to have an emergency plan ready. The perfect shelter is not about paranoia or fantasy, but about preparation and realism. Most people will never build a full bunker, but knowing what actually works and what does not can help you make smart decisions when it matters. What do you think? Have you ever thought about building a shelter or do you have any experience with emergency preparedness? Share your ideas, questions, or even your local tips in the comments. If you want a more advanced guide with blueprints and technical calculations, let me know. And if you have made it this far, you are not just scrolling for the next headline. You are part of a community that values clarity over hype. Subscribe now for more guides that go beyond survival myths and get to the facts that could one day make a difference. Stay safe, Safety Zone.